Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent you me to be your a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this, I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. All right. So this morning in your bulletin next to sermon, it says, Parable of the Rich Fool, sermon title, TBD. And I did not forget to give Pam and Amanda a title. The TBD is intentional because I recently heard a preacher say that you really don't know the title of any sermon until after you've preached it. So I thought it might be fun to take a stab at this and see what title God may give this sermon for you. And I'd love to hear your title suggestions for how you hear this sermon. So pay attention. (laughs) So this is a little bit of a tough parable to listen to when you might possibly resemble the title. And it gets even tougher to fully contemplate it and take a hard look at how we too might be rich fools from time to time. Rich, of course, is contextual. For any of us in this congregation, we are rich compared to almost any worldly standard of living metric. Yet that doesn't mean that it's wine and roses all the time and financial struggles can beset any of us. And for any of us in this congregation, We have all been fools from time to time. Maybe we still are. From time to time, all of us can resemble the title of this parable. And today's parable, sometimes it's referred to as a rally cry against wealth. That seems to be the general takeaway from what I would call the traditional Sunday school interpretation, that the rich rich people tend to be fools and they're greedy. And I want you to invite you to resist landing there too hard and to be reminded that the stories Jesus tells usually have a deeper meaning than might appear at first blush. So money is a huge topic that's referenced all throughout the Bible. John Ortberg recently shared these tidbits about the Bible and money. Of 30 parables in the New Testament, 19 of them are set in an economic context. The parable of the lost coin, the talents of the unjust steward, of workers in the vineyard, the two debtors, and today's story of the rich fool. Some authors have counted that thousands of verses can be found on economic or social justice, wealth and money issues. And after that, idolatry, which is the second most frequent topic of both the Old and New Testament, is socioeconomic, interestingly. It was interesting to find that researching this this week. In the New Testament, economic inquiries are discussed on an average of every 16th verse, and in the Gospel of Luke, it's as often as every 7th verse. There's a lot to say here. We haven't only had a feeling that the most valuable things should be given for free, that they should not be available for purchase. It's precisely the most valuable things in life that we must not be sold or monetized. And he continues, the notion comes from somewhere within us that precise reciprocity is undesirable for important things 
or for people close to us. Luke and other New Testament writers tell us that Jesus' ministry was supported by wealthy women who gave out of their own resources. The ministry of Jesus and the ministry of every spiritual organization depends upon money to keep things afloat. Money is essential to every human being and to every human organization. But there's a huge difference between money and the love of money. Money is neutral, neither good or bad. And love of money? Well, that is idolatry. Worshiping as God, that which is not God. And it is labeled as the root of all evils. It's not about the money. It's about the why behind the money. And it's about the heart. We've talked before about churches and the metrics we've used to measure success. And it used to be butts and bucks. How many butts in the pews? And how many bucks in the collection plate? What metrics are we using at Community Church to determine our success as a church? In other words, how do we define success? In the book Future Church, Seven Laws of Real Church Growth by Will Mancini and Corey Hartman, they say that the real measure of success is better realized by how we would answer this question. How many people in the church could I call at 2 a.m. and know they would be there for me? If your answer is none, or you would like more 2 a.m. friends, see me after the service, and I will connect you with a Bible study group, and we will get you some. Now, we've heard people say that church is a business, and we've heard it said at our church that this is a business, and that actually is a lie, not a malicious lie, but it's something that's not really true. We are not a business. We are a church. Now, a church has business-like activities and decisions to make all the time. We have payroll, utilities, property maintenance, accounting, administrative work, human resources functions, just like every business in the world has. Regardless of the industry, why does a business exist? A business exists to make a profit. The product or service they provide is the vehicle to provide profits. The world and shareholders, despite whatever marketing rhetoric is used, doesn't care very much about the motivations behind the business activities. The world and the shareholders care about how much money did we make. And if that's not enough, or does not provide an acceptable ROI, return on investment, they'll find someone else to run the business. And what are we? Are we a business like every other business? To make a profit? Well, no. By legal definition, we are a nonprofit, a 501c3 corporation, and we are a specific kind of nonprofit. We are a church which affords us other considerations in terms of taxation and organizational structure. And I think we also need to remind ourselves of what a church is. A church is not a building. It's not an institution. A church is us. A church is you and me. A church is the ecclesia. A church is the gathered people. We don't go to church. We are the church. I hope wherever you hear the word church, you'll translate it in your mind to the gathered people. Church equals gathered people. And what is the purpose of this church? Or maybe a better way to ask this, what is the purpose of us gathering together? We have a statement of purpose listed in our bylaws, and there's a group that Joanne has been leading in the Salt and Light Conversations that's doing more conversation around this, what our church is today, and you'll get to hear some of that soon as it's all being um, finished up, the ideas of it. But in our bylaws, it states, the purpose of this church shall be to bind together followers of Jesus Christ for the purpose of sharing in the worship of God and in making God's will dominant in the lives of all of its members, individually and collectively, especially as that will is set forth in the life, teachings, death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Do we believe this? Or are these just a bunch of words we threw together to sound nice? to sound religious. If we don't believe this, we should all go home and stop wasting our time and join some other club that shares our interests better. 
a country club or a yacht club or an investment club or fill in the blank. As a church, is our goal to make money or store up more money to keep us safe? Did you know that there's almost always an inverse relationship between the size of a church endowment and the financial giving by the membership and the engagement and vibrancy of a congregation? There are many churches that have a significant endowment that ensures that they can keep the lights on. They can pay a pastor, and yet they are dying because there are dwindling members and dwindling giving by those who do remain. After all, the reasoning goes, the church has plenty of money, they don't need my money, and that's another lie we can tell ourselves. In the life of every organization, there are seasons, and what I know from personal experience is when we, as community church, as the gathered people, focused on being rich towards God, resources came in. We'll talk about, more about what it might mean to be rich towards God, as Jesus put it in the parable, but it's important to realize the goal was not to get resources or to store up money. The resources came as a response to seeking God first, to practice being rich toward God. Put God first and everything else will fall into place. We heard it from our little ones this morning. If the goal of the church was to make money and the church has a huge endowment that will guarantee they will be able to keep the lights on, but there are few members, little vibrancy of community, minimal impact on the lives of the few who are there, and minimal impact on the community around them, is that church a success? How many 2 a.m. friends do you have in the church? As a church, as a gathered people, our goal is to bind together and make God's will dominant in our lives. What does that mean to make God's will dominant? Who is God? And what would God's will be? It seems through all we know that God is a lot of things, but above all else, God is love. And if God is love, his will for us will be love as well. And to extend that love to others, do you remember Jesus' words from Matthew 22, 37 to 40? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Do we believe that? Or are those just a bunch of words Jesus threw together so that when we read them, we will think they sound nice, they sound religious, but we have no intention of doing anything of those words? If we don't believe this, we should all go home and stop wasting our time and join some other club that shares our interests better, a country club or a yacht club or an investment club or fill in the blank. If the goal of the church, meaning the goal of the gathered people, is to make God's will dominant, then the goal is love. The purpose is love. The why we gather together is love. And if we are not finding that love, experiencing that love, finding meaning and purpose, sharing that love with others, then we are out of business. We are bankrupt. And even if we have money in the bank, we have nothing left. That is the message Jesus gives in telling the story about the rich fool. When Jesus tells this parable, it's getting very close to the end of his ministry as he prepares to go to Jerusalem. He's teaching out in the open air again, and now the crowd is numbered in the thousands. Luke tells us they trampled on one another. Jesus tells the crowd to beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, meaning beware of the hypocrisy of the religious leaders who say good words, who sound very religious, and who do not live that way. He says, nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered. And then he goes on to say, what we believe in, what we trust, who we follow, that is more important than anything, even if it means death. For Jesus, this was to mean his actual death. For many of his followers, this also has meant their actual death. For most of us, this probably means the little deaths that happen all the time. 
the loss of whatever we think is important, power, prestige, influence, relevance, money, all of these things are temporary and fleeting. Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body, because after that, they can do nothing more. But God continues to act even after our actual death. That is to whom we should pay attention. So all of that is set up for what comes next when we read today's parable lesson. Someone from the crowd asked Jesus to be the judge and arbiter and wants Jesus to force his brother to share the family inheritance with them. Jesus refuses to get involved in this family dispute, and I can imagine him saying to himself, did they not hear a word I just said? (laughs) Instead, he prepares to tell the parable story, and he says, be on your guard for against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he tells the story. Let's do a little line-by-line overview. The land of the rich man produced abundantly. What does this tell us? The man was already rich. He was not labeled a fuel yet. He was simply a rich man, and he was reaping even more from the land that he owned. And then he thought to himself, what should I do? for I have no place to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. There is not a we or an us to be found anywhere in those sentences. What there is are eyes and himself and my. The rich man's only counsel is himself. His only concern is what he has. His focus is on money over and to the exclusion of a focus on any other person, any other community, and what seems to be a total unawareness of the richness of his blessings and the source of those blessings. The land produced abundantly is a statement that seems to be implying that it happened without any extra effort on the part of the rich man. That reminds me of our reflection a few weeks ago in our prayers of the people when we were reminded of how many blessings come to us that are not a result of our own efforts. We are often a people who wake up on third base and think we've hit a triple. With all this overflowing abundance, The rich man decides he needs to tear down his old barns and build bigger barns to hold all his crops. And after that's accomplished, he can relax, take it easy. He can eat, drink, and be merry, which was the Epicurean's motto at the time. Is there something wrong with building bigger barns? Is there something wrong with growth and expansion of wealth? Of course not. The danger is in the greed that can become our motivation, leading us to choose this kind of wealth building over building God wealth. Building God wealth is how we are rich towards God, and that is what Jesus is telling us to choose. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Every time we choose money over people and connections and community, we are guilty of being rich fools who are in the business of building bigger barns, hoping they will keep us safe and secure, which they will not. The rich man has missed the point. Even as he dances close to the truth, he says, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods. Soul, is the deepest essence of who we are, who God has created us to be, who we're becoming. And the rich man misses the point. His soul is not found in his wealth and ample goods. His soul is something far greater, and he has not recognized it yet. And if we understand the truth of this lack of recognition, it makes us sad for the rich fool. 
and for many of us who have not recognized the truth of it ourselves. And after reminding the rich man that his life is being demanded and asking whose treasure will belong to then, Jesus finishes the parable with this line. So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. Missing the point, choosing bigger barns over bigger hearts and more love, that is the greed that dooms us. The greed that robs us of the fullness of life, like a thief in the night. What should be our orientation after listening to this parable? What would be helpful? Let's do a little congregational participation. Everybody raise up your hands and make some tight fists with your hands. And as tight as you can hold it, keep holding it. Feel how much energy that takes to clutch and grasp and hold on to. Now take a deep breath and hold it for the count of four and squeeze. And as you exhale, open your hands wide and hold them up and open. This is a posture to hold. You can put your hands down if you like now, or keep them up. (laughs) What advice do we need to be paying attention to in order to live well in this season of life? Perhaps it is to live with loose hands, open hands, loose fingers, let go. Because when we do that, we are trusting in and we are investing in a spiritual reality we are receiving from God not investing in bigger barns. We are trusting in and investing in bigger hearts, and we are living into that spiritual reality. Remember that almost every time Jesus tells a parable, he either states directly or implies that the story is being told to reveal what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like. And both of those terms are interchangeable to Jesus. And he reminds us that the kingdom of God is at hand, among you, within you. That is our spiritual reality. Open hands, generosity and trusting, and living into the spiritual reality of that kingdom. When we put our trust into things like money, power, prestige, influence, and bigger barns, Not only do we own things, but things own us. Think of how much energy, time, and money it takes to tear down barns and build bigger ones. Did you know that as of last year, 2023, there are over 23 million self-storage units in the United States that cost over $43 billion a year? We are a nation building bigger barns. And that's just the physical things that can own us. What about the other things we might store up? Storing up seems to beget more storing up. It might be anger, grudges, resentments. It could be guilt or regrets. It could be pride or arrogance. Maybe we're storing up the need for approval or attention or recognition. Maybe it's perfectionism or the need to be right, or the need to have the final word. Maybe it's criticism, or condemnation, or judgmentalism. Or maybe it's fear, worry, and anxiety. The list could go on and on, and the reality is, if we are storing these things up for ourselves, eventually these things will demand our life, emotionally, spiritually, and sometimes even physically. These stored up things can own us and will kill the soul. Is there anything that owns me right now? As a church, as a gathered people, is there anything that owns us right now? And any time we choose greed, any time we choose things over relationships and community, they own us. Anytime we choose to be right, having the last word, winning, criticism, 
judgmentalism. Anytime we choose these things over relationships and community, they own us. That is what Jesus is warning us about. We may choose to ignore the warning and to ignore the advice Jesus has given us, but we can never say we didn't know. This parable is not a story about the evils of wealth and is definitely not saying making money and accumulating wealth is a bad thing. It is about misplaced priorities and greed. When is enough enough? Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life is available for all of us. The only price is our lives given over to the will of God, bound together with others doing the same thing. Abundant life in God through Jesus in our individual lives, and in the shared lives together as a church, as the gathered people of God. What better abundance could there be? May we know we don't need to follow the ways of the rich fool. How can you live with a generous spirit today? What is your sermon title? May we live rich towards God. Amen.